It's Bama, Texas week, and we have a Locked On crossover. It's Jonathan Davis from Locked On Longhorns. And I have Luke Robinson from Locked On Bama. Luke, what's going on? How you doing, Jonathan? It's great. A very exciting matchup between the number one team in the country coming to Austin to face Steve Sarkeesian and the Texas Longhorns on Saturday. The spread is 20, 20 and a half. Nobody is giving the Longhorns a chance to win this game against Bryce Young, Will Anderson, and the Crimson Tide. So I've came together with our Locked On Bama host, Luke Robinson, for this crossover to tell you everything you need to know about the game, maybe a little trash talk. And at the end of the day, we're going to figure out who's going to win this game and why. But Luke, I've done, I've done a little research, right? I've listened to a few episodes of Locked On Bama and – these are some things that I heard on Locked On Bama throughout the week. I think Alabama beats Texas 48 to 14, but honestly, I hope we beat Texas worse than that. <laughs> Texas isn't a real blue blood in comparison to Alabama. Texas will one day be good again, but I'm not sure if Sark will be the coach to do it. Texas beat ULM 52 to 10. But honestly, it wasn't as dominant as the score looked. And this is going to be a coming out party for the defense. Multiple sacks, multiple interceptions, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see a lot of Hudson Card in the second half. Strong stuff on Locked On Bama this week. So as the host of Locked On Longhorns and a representative of Longhorn Nation, I have to ask, what made y'all say these things? What made y'all comfortable to put this out there on B. John Robinson's internet? I have to know. First of all, totally respect B. John Robinson. I do think he's the best <laughs> running back in the country. I, I'm, I'll give him 100% props there. I, I think he's fantastic. I really do. Uh, secondly, I, I think you either we did a poor job of communicating or you misheard. We didn't say Texas is not a blue blood. I said Texas is one of the top 10 teams in uh, college football all time, no matter what they've been over the last decade or whatever. Um, they have not had a great decade. We all know this. Alabama went through a period where they didn't have a great time. So, I mean, it's okay. Even the Blue Bloods have down periods. Um, but what I did say, uh, looking through some research, and all this is just on Winsipedia, and it's, it's, it's a great website. It's a great resource if you've ever been to it. And when I started looking, I, I mean, I would have thought Texas would be higher up in win percentage, total wins, um, national championships, even Heisman trophies. I, I'm not a Heisman trophy historian, but if you had asked me yesterday before I looked it up and somebody had said, how many Heisman trophies does Texas have? I'd say, well, I know of two in my lifetime, and I bet you they had one or two before that, so I'll say three or four. Well, they only have those two, which kind of shocked me a little bit. Um, and, and so my point is, and, and here's the other thing, Texas has all the resources in the world. Look, I, I'm from the great state of Alabama. I love Alabama. Yeah, we got our problems. I mean, we okay, we that's well established. Read a history book. But um, Alabama is a great state. I mean, it really is. It's got everything you want. But we don't have the resources of Texas. And Alabama's got great fans, and they have great history, and they have great um, passion for this university. But, man, Texas is on another level. And my point was – I'm more shocked that Texas isn't more dominant. I think, you know, people love to look at Alabama and Texas and, and call our fans arrogant. And I, I say, you're right. We, we both kind of are. Um, but right now, I think Alabama fans, at least over the last 14, 15 years, the arrogance is pretty much warranted. I mean, the worst season we've had since 2008 was a 10-3 and three year where we went to the Citrus Bowl and beat Michigan State so bad, I'm not sure they've recovered yet. We're still getting Spartans out of our cleats from that Citrus Bowl. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, it's okay to say we, we're we arrogant and we've earned it. I think Texas, at, uh, you know, Colt McCoy's getting hurt, notwithstanding. Um, I think that uh, since then, that get national title game against Alabama, they just haven't done enough. And – it's, it's probably their own fault. I mean, they've hired some, made some bad hires or made some good hires, some hires they thought would be great hires. I mean, I thought Tom Herman, Tom Herman would be awesome. I thought Charlie Strong would be awesome. I, I would have hired those guys. Turns out they just didn't work for whatever reason. 
And um, Texas just hadn't been as good as they probably should be. And it's got to be super frustrating. And um, so I think that's where we're coming from. I look at Texas's roster right now and I say, B. John Robinson's best running back in the country. That's hard to argue. Xavier Worthy, man, it could be a, a second or third team All-American wide receiver by the time all is said and done. But then what? I mean, I'm not uh, I'm not insulting anybody else on the team. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying where are the multiple potential Heisman, I mean, not Heisman, All-American candidates. Um, Quinn Ewers, he might have a coming out party. I'm a huge recruitnik. I love following recruiting. I have all my whole life. I'm almost 50 years old. But Quinn Ewers, I thought when he went to Ohio State, was going to be the next big thing. And it, it, he's already transferred to Texas in his first game against ULM. It, it was fine. It was fine. It wasn't great. Um, I, so my point is that, um, you know, I just feel like Texas is, is not capturing – not not getting a lot of return on the investment, and the investment is there. I mean, all the resources there, all the money's there, all the passions there. I've been to Austin a bunch of times. I love that city. I mean, it's all right there for Texas to have it. So I'm thrilled we're playing this game. I'm thrilled Texas is coming into the SEC, but it still means I really believe. I think I'm the one that predicted 48-14 Alabama, and I'll stand by it. So let's let's talk about that then. So on the field reasons, right? I'm sure that's why uh, the Crimson Tide fans are here and the Longhorn fans are here. They're excited about the game. And so you predicted 48 to 14, but you talked about uh, Nick Saban kind of letting up on the Texas head coach, uh, Steve Sarkeesian, if there's an opportunity to. I got the feeling from listening to Locked On Bama, maybe Crimson Tide Nation did as well, that you feel like this game could get worse than 48 to 14. And that score was kind of conservative. So I need you to tell Longhorn Nation, 50% of people listening to this podcast and watching it on YouTube, why you believe the score is going to be 48-14 or worse? Because I think um, Alabama's offense is is a little better than I thought, a little further along than I thought. I was impressed with what I saw against Utah State. I know Utah State is not uh, a member of the Big 12 or SEC, so I'm not trying to compare them there, but they did win the Mountain West Conference last year. Utah State – has a nice little tradition for a group of five school over the last five, 10 years. So uh, the way they dominated them and the fact that um, Bryce Young wasn't even on his A game necessarily. I would, I could argue Bryce Young, even with five touchdowns, 195 yards passing and hundred yards rushing, which he's never done before. And another touchdown uh, running. That was one of his, I don't know. Wouldn't, I don't even know if it, I'd put it in his top 10 games at Alabama. He was off on a few occasions, and I, that's why I wanted him to play even longer. I wanted him to play on into the second half. He only played the one drive where he scored the rushing touchdown, but I wanted him to play longer to build a rapport with these new receivers because there's no more Jamison Williams. There's no more John Mechie. Shoot, there's no more Jaleel Billingsley. He's over there in Austin, Texas right now. So I, I wanted him to build uh, some chemistry with these new guys. Now, the reason I think it would be 48-14 and it could get worse because I, what I can see happening – is Texas is going to uh, play a different style than Utah State. And Utah State sort of had the attitude of, we're just not going to let you get a sack and we're not going to have a turnover. We'll just, we'll throw it immediately. And if it hits the dirt or goes into the void of space, so be it. I think Texas is going to try and, you know, actually let Quinn Ewers rear back and, and make a few throws. But when you drop back and you take about three or four seconds and you take longer than Utah State did, that gives Will Anderson and Dallas Turner time to get where they're supposed to go. So they, they will be either sacks, maybe fumbles, maybe some more interceptions. Alabama didn't even create a turnover in this last game. I think they will create some turnovers in this game. And when that starts happening, um, that's when things can really get sideways for Bama's opponent. So, I mean, case in point, Georgia 2015, Alabama goes up there. Next thing you know, they blocked a punt and returned a pick all the way. And it's completely out of hand. And you're like, how did this game get out of hand? I, I can see something like that happen. So – we know uh, that Alabama was not the traditional Alabama powerhouse in road games last year. And Bryce Young uh, didn't necessarily have his Heisman performances uh, last year on the road. And I mentioned this earlier on a, a radio station in uh, Alabama and got kicked off. <laughs> so hopefully I get a better reception here. But he faces a true road test uh, against Quinn Ewers, Xavier Worthy and B. John Robinson in Austin, Texas this Saturday at DKR. So why do you have confidence that things will be different this time around? 
Well, I would say also that it wasn't necessarily all Bryce Young's fault. I mean, you think about the Texas A&M game. That's the most famous game from last year on the road, right? Well, uh, the, the thing that really killed Alabama there was the defense at the end. Bryce Young actually brought them back. Um, and then there was a kickoff return for a touchdown that just reversed the momentum. Alabama had regained the momentum. You could see it coming that, like, here comes Alabama now, and A-Chain returns a kick for a touchdown. Then you talk about the Auburn game. Look, I know uh, – Texas, they have a a rivalry with Oklahoma, which I truly respect and want to go to one day. But it's not the Iron Bowl. I don't mean that insultingly. I encourage everybody to go to one Iron Bowl. That is total disregard for your fellow man. That is everybody can't stand the other side. It, It works both ways. The Iron Bowl is different. It always ends up different. It is the weirdest game in college football generally every year. There's kick sixes. There's um you know, last second field goals. There's uh, field goals that doink off the uh, goalpost. I mean, it's the weirdest thing every year. And um, the Iron Bowl was just, it, it was at a bad time for Alabama right before they go to play Georgia in a huge matchup. And I would argue Alabama wasn't quite up for the game as they should have been. They probably felt like Auburn was going to mail it in and Auburn did anything but that. Much, much props to Auburn because they showed up to play. But you know what? Bryce Young didn't have his best game, and guess what he did? Went 97 yards in about a minute to tie the game up when Alabama hadn't scored a touchdown their entire game. So even his bad games, he does something pretty magical. And um, I don't think he's going to have another game where he was as off target, and I use that term very loosely, as he was against Utah State. Okay, quick word from Upside, and then we'll get more into this matchup uh, between the Texas Longhorns and the Alabama Crimson Tide on Saturday. From cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts, and it really hurts. That's why I started using Upside, because Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. Download the free Upside app and use promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using promo code LOCKED. So, Luke, we're about 12 minutes in, and uh, we've had a beautiful soliloquies about Bryce Young and why he's going to be better and how this Alabama defense is going to just feast on Quinn Ewers in his second career start. And Alabama has a more storied history than uh texas the university of texas alabama is a better state than texas the <laughs> iron bowl is better than the red river rivalry tech i mean alabama's gonna win 48 to 14 just the disrespect so i'm sure the crimson tie want to know something about texas or you might want to know why i think this score will be closer to 48 14 so i don't know i mean do i have the floor was was you know let me know what, what yeah. do you need to know what do the crimson tie fans need to know Hey, about Eric, the Longhorns. I do have. Uh, I do want you to tell me why you think it'll be close. In fact, I know you've said you think Texas will pull the upset I, I, all summer long. You've been Alabama's going to win in a blowout, and this last week, you know, hope springs eternal. Um, I do want you to explain that. I do want to reiterate. I didn't say Alabama was better than Texas in the state. I didn't say that. I love Texas. I love. I love one of my favorite signs is when you enter Texas and it's like uh, Houston is forty miles away and. I can't remember what the El Paso is 868 miles away. We don't have any signs. Yeah. Y'all got cool signs. Um, yeah. But, but, you know, one thing I do want to know is how the guys that transferred over to Texas from Alabama, do you, how do you think they're doing a Jai Hall, Jaleel Billingsley, Keelan Robinson? And then uh, why do you have optimism? Because again, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to speak in truths here. I, what I see Alabama's roster is better. And Alabama has the has played in bigger games and won bigger games. So tell me why Texas fans should have optimism. Yeah. So as far as uh, I think you said El Paso, I believe I, I might not be true, but El Paso is closer to L.A. than it is to like certain cities in Texas. It's crazy. Yeah, right. um, but yeah. So Keelan Robinson, I think he's doing well in his type of role, obviously on special teams. Uh, he had the touchdown. Uh, against ULM where Deshaun Jameson blocked the punt, he picked it up and, and ran it in. And I think uh, he's an excellent weapon in the offense. And I think a key thing, because he's in the best running back room in the country, as Sark says, is that he doesn't complain, right? And he fits his culture. He knows that everybody on that Texas offense is going to get the ball. He doesn't complain uh, about the amount of touches he gets, and he probably could get more. Um, Jalil Billingsley is in the midst of serving a six-game suspension, and so he will be out until after the Oklahoma game. And then Ajay Hall uh, recently returned to the team. He did not play against ULM. We'll see 
uh, how much he plays against Alabama. But I'm sure Sark will have something for y'all, <laughs> right? And, and Ajay Hall is back to practicing this week. When you talk about uh, why I'm confident, and yes, you know, all offseason, uh, I was like, you know, Alabama is the better team. I still believe Alabama is the better team. And I think it's going to take a lot uh, for Texas to beat Alabama on Saturday. But I think the biggest key is this Texas team has something to prove and Sark has something to prove, right? Sark is an elite offensive coordinator and play caller. And I think that he's recognized for that around college football, but the jury on Sark as a head coach is still out, right? Especially when at Washington and USC, he leaves uh, in the fashion that he did. He goes to the coaching rehabilitation program at Alabama where coaches, <laughs> you know, go to revitalize their career. And then he, you know, comes to Texas and his first year isn't great. He's got something to prove as a head coach. I think this football team has something to prove, uh, which has always been one of the, top two talented teams in the big 12 but like you said haven't been able uh to get over that hump um and and you know make it to the big 12 championship game uh perennially or you know just live up to the the brand that texas has um and when you look at it i think this team has nothing to lose they're 20 point underdogs and a team with a lot of talent and i believe although he's you know going into his second career start a very good quarterback a play caller that's going to script his first 20 plays get his players comfortable and he knows alabama right from his time under nick saban of course you know nick saban knows him but i do think that that's going to help sark out a little bit knowing uh what nick saban likes to do knowing those players helping having recruited them uh being in their living rooms and, and like i said i just think that uh, outside of will anderson uh you out you know i'll say bryce Young because he won the heisman you know, the next best player on the uh, on the field is is B. John Robinson, right? And you got Xavier Worthy, and you talked about him. And I think there's gonna be some opportunities for those receivers on the outside uh, with man coverage. Because I think they're gonna try to stop B. John Robinson, and they're gonna make Quinn Ewers beat him. And you know, his offensive line is gonna have to play great. But stranger things have happened. They're at home. We talked about uh, Alabama and how they kind of I don't want to say play down to their competition, but definitely. Uh, didn't blow out teams like we're used to seeing in Tuscaloosa and in neutral site games um, and true road games last year. And then I think this defense, uh, albeit against ULM, you know, we talked about some takeaways from Alabama, Utah State. This defense was flying to the ball uh, last week, and it's their second year in the system for the first time in four years. The addition of Gary Patterson, I think they look cleaner on the defensive side. They're more talented on the defensive side, uh, and they look hungry. And like I said, this is a team that has better culture, a, a better energy, and they have nothing to lose on Saturday. And so I think they go out there and, and definitely have the potential to shock the world. But I'm going to go all the way and say they do it on Saturday. And their, their backs are against the wall and they have nothing to lose. And you're right. Alabama's the better team. Uh, definitely better coach. They've been in bigger games. They've been in this situation. They played in the last two national championships. But like you said, crazier things, crazier things have happened. And, and I think that Texas has enough uh, dog in them and enough talent on the field to go out there and pull off the upset on Saturday. Well, look, I think it'd be kind of nutty. Uh, for you not to have hope, honestly. I mean, I, 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 there are Alabama folks that take it as an insult when when other fans say, yeah, I think we can beat y'all. I mean, and it's not insulting to me because I get it. I mean, that's how you should be. You should go into this game thinking we have a shot because, of course, you do. I mean, Texas does have some dudes. And the only issue I have, and this is where I want you to tell me, um, okay, you mentioned Will Anderson and Bryce Young. They they're probably are the two best players on the field. And they're not – Look, I have no problem saying B. John Robinson's next. I think B. John Robinson is a top 10, top 15 NFL draft pick. That's it's a big deal. Um, but then after that, I, I mean, the Alabama guy would make the argument the next several guys that are best on the field are probably Alabama players. And that's where I think the differential comes in. But tell me, uh, your offensive line, I know there was a big injury uh, before the season that people thought may have an effect on this offensive line. Number one, uh, is that still the case? Would you? How do you think the offensive line did against Lyman Monroe? And number two, um, are you guys still a little bitter about losing out on the Brocker Myers? I'm just curious about that. And are you surprised <laughs> that they have not broken through on Alabama's depth chart? Yeah, so definitely there was a lot of talk uh, on the Brocker Myers when the first depth chart came out and they weren't listed on the two deep. And so, um, yeah, there were some Texas fans kind of, you know, talking their smack a little bit. I know we're uh, talked about as the wine and cheese fan base, uh, one of the nicer fan bases, I guess. But, yeah, there was a little shade thrown on Twitter uh, when they didn't make the two deep. But uh, you know how college football is nowadays. Everybody just started immediately went to, well, transfer portal, transfer portal. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, as far as the offensive line, yes, they lost Junior Angelau. Jake Majors was the starting center last year. And, I mean, the offensive line wasn't great, but he did have those reps as the starter. They were looking to put Junior Angelau at that position to get bigger 
on the interior offensive line, uh, but he tore his ACL in the first scrimmage and is out for the season. So you put Jake Majors back in that spot, who was the starter um, all year last year and just doesn't have the strength or the size that Junior Angelow has. I thought that the offensive line uh, looked pretty looked pretty good. I think Kelvin Banks, a true freshman left tackle, uh, one of the best tackles in the nation in this 2022 class, one of the headliners of the seven offensive linemen uh, that Texas brought in. He didn't allow a pressure. Um, according to advanced stats on uh, Saturday, they did give up. I, you said it in the show, right? Three, uh, three, yeah, three sacks. Um, but I think a couple of those, two of those were in the game with Hudson Carr, where the third team offensive line was in. So it's Louisiana Monroe. You have to gauge it, you know, to a certain level of extent. But I thought the offensive line looked really great. But of course, uh, the challenge they have <laughs> this coming up Saturday is a lot different um, than they had on the, on the one uh, last Saturday. But like I said, for them to win this game, they're going to have to play up to the level of competition and they're going to have to have the best games of their lives. Right. Especially at the tackle positions with uh, Kelvin Banks and Kristen Jones, they're going to have to have the, the game of their lives. And um, I think Joel Klatt said that Sark is going to have to act as a sixth offensive lineman with his play calling. And I think that's true. I don't think that Texas can win the game solely throwing short, but that definitely has to be a huge part of the game plan. Uh, like you said, with Utah state, because uh, if Dallas Turner and Will Anderson uh, get going, then it's good night, Irene. There's no doubt about it. A um, couple other things I need to ask you, and I want to get into this uh, outside of the game. How excited are, is the fan base coming into the SEC? Uh, or, and do you think that it could happen sooner rather than later? I know the, the talk is it won't happen until 2026, but I would love to see it happen in 2024. Uh, I think it needs to go. we need to go ahead and make it happen, and let's just get in there. Because, frankly, if Texas and Oklahoma do well, it doesn't help the Big 12 right now. In fact, that Texas and Oklahoma right now, every time you hear them play, all you hear, the only talk is future SEC participants, Texas and Oklahoma. So I think it does the Big 12 no favors that Texas and Oklahoma are still allowed to be there. And I think every Alabama fan wants to know this. this the answer to this question is so important. Does anybody have an update on the pet monkey of the pole assassin? <laughs> no pet monkey update. And, yeah, I think that uh, the latest that Texas and, and uh, Oklahoma are supposed to go to the SEC, I think it's 2025. Uh, right, uh, right. But there's plenty of talk about, you know, it happening earlier. I think, you know, when you look at the new commissioner, I think that, you know, he's just a businessman and he's not going to let – um, Texas and Oklahoma leave early unless it benefits uh, the Big 12 in, in any form of capacity because, you know, we're already leaving anyway. And so he has no incentive to let us leave early unless it benefits the Big 12 even after we leave. And so I think it'll happen, uh, especially with these new TV contracts and all the realignment talk. I think it does happen um, before 2025. And, um, you know, you talked about what drives everything in this sport and this money. So I definitely think that Texas and Oklahoma will be in the SEC as soon as possible. And then the Big 12, um, I mean, they're not replacing uh, Texas and Oklahoma, but they do add a, a Cincinnati, a BYU, a U of H, and I'm missing somebody. But um, so, you know, they are adding some reinforcements as well. So I think it uh, – happen sooner than later as far as Texas going to the SEC. And, and the fans are definitely really excited. Um, I think, for one, it adds a, a whole bunch of uh, matchups that you weren't used to seeing. Um, you know, now you see Texas against Arkansas uh, a lot more, Texas against LSU a lot more, and then you're playing the Auburns, the Alabamas, the Georgias, the Floridas, the Tennessees. I mean, you know what they say about the SEC, right? It just means more, right? And I guess it just will mean more when Texas and, and Oklahoma – get to the the sec but you know you asked about the the texas offensive line i have to get get back to this and, and get some nuggets for our, our longhorn nation because i was listening to locked on bama and i've also listened to some uh you know breakdown videos of, of this alabama team and this offensive line doesn't seem to be as daunting as the ones that y'all have had in the past so there may be an opportunity for this texas defense to you know maybe get to to bryce young and make some plays on jameer gibbs in the backfield I don't think there's any doubt about that. There's no Alabama fan out there right now that, that will tell you this is one of Nick Saban's better offensive lines. Neither was last year. I think this offensive line this year is better than last year's. Um, but th that sort of remains to be seen, right? We've only seen one game. And um, the, the boy, you hate it when people say this, but the talent does seem to be there. It just hadn't gelled. I think chemistry along the offensive line is about as important as any position group anywhere in sports. And um, I, I just don't know if it's there quite yet. Alabama's brought in Tyler Steen, who's a transfer from Vanderbilt, uh, who's very good. 
but he hasn't played uh, at the University of Alabama and played with these guys. So uh, there, there's going to be a learning curve. And look, when people talk about Bryce Young last year, I know you talk about maybe some struggles on the road. And struggles is all relative, right? I mean, struggles compared to some of his unbelievable home games. Um, but he did take a lot of sacks last year. I think one thing uh, that, that may change that a little bit this year is he's going to be given the green light to run a little bit more. We saw that he had a hundred yards rushing uh, in this past game. And I say green light because I, I really believe this. Um, nobody, no coach would probably ever admit it, but it certainly feels that, like this is true that last year he, he was basically told, look, don't run unless you, unless it's, it's a must, 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 must. And it's like a huge moment because um, we can't get you hurt. You know, back behind you is Jalen Milrow. Love Jalen Milrow. Think he's going to be great. He was committed to Texas at one time. But he wasn't ready to uh, lead Alabama to a national championship right then, and um, or an SEC title for that matter. So I feel like th- there was there was sort of a tacit agreement, okay, we're not going to run very much next year, which does occasionally lend itself to being sacked more. Uh, Because you saw as the year progressed, when Alabama got into the national, excuse me, the SEC title game, Bryce Young did run a little bit more. He had some huge runs in that game. Um, So it seems like he was given more, he's been given more and more of a green light. And in his past game, he certainly uh, used that a lot. But his, even Bryce has, um, his, his preference is to throw the ball. Even when he's about to run, he's always got his eyes up looking for somebody to throw to. Um, he's got pretty quick feet and he's a great athlete, but um, at the same time, he would rather pass the ball than run the ball. I don't think there's any doubt about that, but going back to the offensive line, um, one other thing that was an issue uh, this last week was there was no Cameron Latu. And that is a starting tight end who it, Bryce Young had some great chemistry with, especially towards the end of the year. And it's going to be good having him back for the Texas game. Look, I, I'm, 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 I say this with all honesty. I'm pulling for Jaleel Billingsley. I know he's not active in this game. I'm pulling for Ajay Hall. Uh, I, I pulled for Ben Davis, who transferred over there the year before. Pulled for Keelan Robinson. You know, I, I, I'm a fan of all those kids. Sometimes it just doesn't work out at Alabama or anywhere, for that matter. And um, I, I'm pulling for him. But uh, I really wish Jaleel Billingsley had worked out at Alabama because I think he's immensely talented. And if he were on this team and everything were everything, I think he would be a, an All-American tight end type. Definitely has the talent. Um, and when you talk about pass catchers, this group at uh, Alabama doesn't seem to have a true alpha uh, like in years past. Now, maybe you don't have an alpha when you have Jerry Judy, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle, and Henry Ruggs. They're just all great first-round receivers. But I don't think they have uh, the cadre of receivers at Alabama that they're used to having. And, of course, JoJo Earl – from Alito, Texas is going to miss this game. Unfortunately, you know, he could have played in his own backyard in DKR on Saturday. So how do you assess the the pass catching situation uh, for Bryce Young? If his offensive line isn't what we're used to seeing at Alabama, and it seems we could say the same about the receiving court. I I think one big uh, caveat is going to be that Jameer Gibbs is the best receiving running back that, that Bryce will have played with yet. Jason McClellan's pretty good in that arena. He had two receiving touchdowns this past game. But Jameer Gibbs is, is just different. I mean, he's he's a really nice running back. He's really nice at a lot of things. I wouldn't call him, uh, you know, necessarily just an all-American running back. But when it comes to all-purpose back, I think he is an all-American. I think he can do a lot of different things really, really well. He's an eventual first-round talent. Um, and you're right, Alabama's receiving room, while very talented and has a lot of stars and a lot of um, – high school prominence, it, it, it doesn't have the same mm, cachet that, that maybe uh, last year had, or definitely not the year. I mean, Alabama at one time had Tua Dungabailoa slinging the rock. It had Jerry Judy. It had Henry Ruggs. It had Devontae Smith and it had Jalen Waddle all, and Irv Smith all on the same team. That's not right. And so uh, Bryce Young doesn't have the luxury of having – those dudes to throw to those are all first NFL first rounders. Um, and this year, I don't even know if Jermaine Burton would end up being a first rounder. I hope he is, but I don't know that he will be. Um, and John Mechie, if he hadn't been injured, he might have been. So he might have lost two first rounders from last year in Mechie and Jameson Williams. So I, I don't know that he's got a first rounder to throw to, but Treshawn Holden's really coming around. Um, I love the freshman Kobe Prentice from Calera, Alabama. He's shown uh, s- some nice. Uh, spurts 
in this game and in scrimmage. He's looked great. So, uh, but it's going to be a different animal out there. You're right. DKR is going to be just hot as Satan sauna out there and it's going to be tough. Yeah. You talked about how hot it's going to be. How upset were you when you found out this was an 11 o'clock game? I was just as upset as y'all. I, I wanted yeah. to not <laughs> pissed. Yeah. yeah. Pissed. That's the atmosphere. Pissed. What the, the atmosphere I saw? Now I didn't go to the game. Obviously, the atmosphere I saw in two thousand nineteen LSU. LSU, LSU game that was awesome. Why can't we have that? Why do we have to get up and tailgate with a uh, uh, egg McMuffin? I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know? No, I, yeah, I absolutely agree. You talked about uh, you know DKR under the lights and that amazing atmosphere um, against LSU, even though uh, you know the visitor locker room AC got turned off allegedly, but um, you know, it was just a, a really fun game, man. And like you said, this is Alabama, Texas. There are no true primetime games, um, you know, in college football because, you know, they're all playing concurrently, but still, you know, at night, you know, under the lights, DKR, everybody watching, like you said, you have to wake up by the time you wake up, get dressed and, and get to the stadium. Uh, the game is about to start. So it's crazy uh, that this, this game is an 11 a.m. kickoff. But, you know, I guess Texas fans are used to it because every year our biggest game of the season, uh, the Red River rivalry in Dallas, is at 11 a.m. So uh, we're coming to the end of the Locked On cross crossover between Locked On Longhorns and, and Locked On Bama and getting ready for one of the biggest games of the year this Saturday uh, between Steve Sarkeesian and Nick Saban. So, uh, Luke, do you have any parting words for Longhorn Nation or – Bama Nation or just anything you want to say before we get out of here? Yeah, I'm 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 even predicting a bigger score now having talked to you. 49 <laughs> to 13 instead of 48 14. How about that? <laughs> 49 13. Listen, Longhorn Nation, I've been saying for a while that Alabama is going to win this game. Alabama should win this game. That's why the spread is is 20 20 and a half and it's going to take a lot for your Texas Longhorns to beat Alabama on Saturday. But why not us? Why can't we shock the world? Texas 41, Alabama, 38, Longhorn Nation, and I guess Bama too. Peace.